Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Ophelia never knew her mother, but in her heart, she deeply loved the woman who had given her life. Every day, she would gaze at her daughter with kind, loving eyes and the photographs on the wall. According to this photo, her mother was very beautiful. She had shoulder-length dark, curly hair, large eyes framed by long lashes, and a soft, kind smile. When Ophelia was little, she would sit on her father's knee and ask him to tell her about the mother who lived in the clouds. The man would sigh sadly and say, Your mother was the most wonderful person. This was the axiom with which Ophelia grew up. In daycare and on the street, she would tell all the other children about her mother. The children reacted differently. If she's so good, why is she on a cloud? Why doesn't she fly to you and bring candy? Neighbor boy, Vasco, was trying to tease the girl. She does, replied Ophelia, sticking her red-booted foot forward and putting her hand on her hip. Mom brings me candies on my birthday and on New Year's. She puts them next to my bed or under the tree. It's not your mother, it's your father who puts them there, Vasco persisted. And you're a liar and a storyteller, your mother doesn't live on a cloud. I do, the girl shouted. She was about to burst into tears when suddenly Clementi stepped between her and Vasco. Ophelia is not lying, he told Vasco. Clementi was two years older than the other children, and they listened to him without question, obeying Clementi's authority as he was already going to school. Her father himself told me how Ophelia's mother ended up in the sky, but it's too early for you to know this, babies. Let's go, Ophelia. The boy took her by the hand and led her to the gate. From that day on, no one dared to even argue with the girl, let alone risk insulting or teasing her. At the slightest attempt to hurt Ophelia, Clementi would appear in front of the bullies like her guardian angel. Don't be afraid, I'll always protect you now, he told the girl. And anyone who dares to bother you will have to deal with my fists. He would clench his palms into fists in front of Ophelia to demonstrate, and she understood that Clementi was serious. Despite the fact that she didn't know her mother, Ophelia always felt that she was somewhere nearby, and she knew that her mother was the best and kindest in the world. The father loved the girl's mother very much. They had married when she was very young. Almost immediately, the young woman became pregnant. The young family was expecting their first child, but the girl's heart could not handle the birth, and she died, leaving her beloved husband with the baby, Ophelia. Ramiro Ferrer directed all his love for his wife to their daughter. Another person might have started drinking or have gone after another woman, but Ramiro stays with the little girl, never leaving her side. Neighbors would gossip, watching the man with a stroller heading to the store for groceries or hanging laundry in the yard. It was clear how he wouldn't have managed if it wasn't for the girl's grandmother. Ramiro's mother came from the neighboring village as soon as she could to help raise the little one. She deeply sympathized with her son. He was so young and already a widower, burdened with a baby. When the girl turned one year old, the mother said, You should get married, son. Ophelia needs a mother. I understand, mom, the man replied, sitting on a bench in the yard next to the stroller, where his daughter was peacefully napping. It's just that I can't even imagine another woman raising Ophelia. What if she hurts her? What if she can't love her like her own? Well, I don't know, but anyway, a child needs a woman's care. Who will teach her household chores, women's wisdom, or cooking? Ramiro thought for a moment, then embraced his mother, who was sitting beside him. You'll help, won't you? He asked. Yes, gladly, but I don't have much time left, and who knows when I'll pass away. You'll live to be a hundred years old, Mom. Why are you thinking like that? Well, each person has their own destiny and their own time allotted. When Ophelia turned five, her father took her to the neighboring village to visit her grandparents. Everything seemed strange to the girl. The large village was nothing like their small village, a daycare with beautifully painted, brightly colored swings, a two-story brick school, and a white stone temple with gilded domes and poppy decorations. You'll go to this school when you grow up a bit more, her father said. They'll teach you to read and write, and you'll learn many interesting things. 
but I already know letters. Grandma bought me an alphabet, and Clementi is teaching me to read syllables, but I can't do it. Stay closer to Clementi. He's a good boy, the father said. The man liked the boy, who never left his little daughter's side. Ramiro calmly let Ophelia play outside if Clementi was around. I'll watch over her, the boy would say with a serious expression, even though he was only seven years old and had just started school. The grandparents were delighted with their dear guests, treated them to various snacks, and didn't let their granddaughter leave their laps. The next day, the grandmother dressed Ophelia in a beautiful new dress, put a scarf on her head, and took her to the temple. Grandma, where are we going? The girl asked on the way to the church. We're going to the priest, he'll bless you, and then you'll wear a silver cross on your neck, the old woman replied. But why? Ophelia didn't understand. So that God never leaves you. Does he live with mommy on a little cloud? Yes, dear. The old woman stopped for a moment and looked attentively at her granddaughter. He protects all of us, your mom, dad, and he will protect you too, and nothing bad will ever happen to you. Let's go, dear, or we'll be late. The mystery of baptism plunged Ophelia into a state of calm and tranquility. The priest, with kind eyes and in beautiful attire, gently touched her head. A small cross on a string appeared around the girl's neck. But what Ophelia liked the most was the gift from her father. In the evening, he called his little daughter and showed her a metal locket with a picture of a beautiful woman holding a baby. This is the Virgin Mary, said the father the protector and intercessor for all children and women. And now look inside. Ramiro opened the locket and showed Ophelia. Inside was a small photo of her mom, exactly like the one hanging on their wall at home, only very small. It's mommy, the girl said in awe. Yes, dear, the father replied, and he hung the locket around Ophelia's neck. Take care of her, and may she always be with you. The girl nodded, looking into her father's eyes, and he stroked her head and hugged her tightly. Ophelia's childhood was happy. Her father took her to school for the first time. The girl in a beautiful school uniform was walking, holding Ramiro with one hand and clutching a bouquet of asters grown in the flower bed next to their house in the other. She was glad that now, like Clementi, she would have classes and go to school with a beautiful backpack on her back and she would also have many new friends. The school was in the neighboring village. Every morning, a bus took children from the village to the school, and after classes, it brought them back. Ramiro worked as a mechanic and couldn't personally take his daughter to school. He worried about it and even asked his mother to meet and accompany her granddaughter at the bus stop. The grandmother lived precisely in the village where Ophelia's school was located. During the first week, she met the bus every morning, picked up Ophelia, and led her to classes. By the end of the lessons, she met her at the entrance and put her on the bus with other village children. But then Ramiro's mother fell ill and was bedridden. Clementi came to the rescue. Don't worry, Ramiro, he said with a businesslike look to Ophelia's father as they returned home from the bus stop together. I'll look after her, we go to the same school, and I see her every break. Everything will be fine. I'll bring her home and check that her feet are dry. Yesterday, while I was in class, she and the girls got into a puddle. They were rescuing a kitten from the water, and her shoes got all wet. Ramiro patted the boy on the shoulder. Well, boy, I trust you, he said with a smile. A couple of weeks later, Ramiro returned home slightly earlier. From the doorway, he heard children's voices. Hold the knife straight, or you'll cut yourself. Clementi said. Don't cut too much. I can't do it, Ophelia whimpered. It'll work out if you practice more often, the boy said instructively. Standing in the doorway, the father was watching with surprise as his little daughter was learning to peel potatoes. Books and notebooks were neatly spread out on the table. The children didn't even notice Ramiro entering. So, what are you doing here? Dad, Daddy, Clementi is teaching me how to peel potatoes, Ophelia shouted joyfully, dropping the knife and hugging her father. Hello, Ramiro. Clementi, looking quite grown up, extended his hand to the man. We're preparing dinner. 
I've finished homework with Ophelia, we've practiced handwriting, read a little, and even drew a picture. The boy confidently showed Ramiro the work they had done. Well done, Ramiro smiled, you did a good job, and what do good workers deserve? Candy, candies, jumping with impatience, Ophelia shouted. Her father spilled a bag of candy onto the table, then went to change his clothes. He offered Clementi to stay for dinner, but the boy declined. I still need to help my mom feed the livestock and bring water, he replied, saying goodbye and leaving. During dinner, the father told Ophelia, Clementi is a good guy. Stick with him, he'll teach you new things and won't let anyone harm you. Throughout their school years, Ophelia and Clementi were inseparable. When people saw them together on the street, they would shout, Tommy and Annie, sitting in a tree. Clementi threatened them with his fist, while Ophelia proudly straightened her back. Fools, she would say, but one day she asked, Would you marry me? Clementi stopped, looked at the girl, and said, I'll marry you when you grow up. Ophelia laughed. Clementi had such a serious face, as if he really intended to marry her. She genuinely loved Clementi and trusted him, but they were just friends. No, you won't, the girl replied. Why not? Clementi didn't understand. Because we're friends, and friends don't get married. You don't understand, Clementi sighed. During the summer, they often went to the river to fish, light a fire, and roast potatoes. Slightly salted and smoky, the potatoes seemed incredibly delicious. While Ophelia's father was at work, Clementi helped with the household chores. In winter, they cleared snow in the yard together, heated the stove, and prepared dinner for Ramiro's return. In the village, no one was surprised to see the childhood friends together as they grew up. Ophelia turned into a true beauty, with the same dark, curly hair and huge eyes with long lashes as her late mother. Clementi, who was older than the girl, became a real man, broad-shouldered, tall, and strong. When Clementi received his conscription notice, he was a bit lost. He knew that he would be drafted into the army soon, and his only concern was how Ophelia would manage without him. Her father was almost never at home. Ramiro worked hard to provide the best for his daughter, and Ophelia's grandparents had passed away a year ago. Clementi's parents organized a farewell for their son. What if he served somewhere far away for two years? That's why they needed a proper farewell. A large table was set in the yard, and neighbors and Clementi's classmates were invited. The girls helped Clementi's mother, and the guys carried dishes, pies, and simple treats to the table. Ophelia was among them. Clementi's father was playing the guitar, sitting on a bench near the fence, and when someone from the village passed by, he invited them to bid farewell to his son and have a sip. The farewell celebration was in full swing when a breathless man rushed into the yard. Is Ophelia here? He shouted loudly, taking off his cap. I'm here, the girl responded. The man hesitated, then, laboriously catching his breath, said, I'm so sorry, Ophelia. Your father, he's gone. Ophelia, who had stood up from the table, sank back onto the bench. The guests fell silent, and the music quietly subsided. He got a shock from the transformer, a short circuit, and that was it, he died instantly. A murmur spread among the guests. The news of the death of Ramiro, the mechanic, silenced the gathering. Sorrowful expressions appeared on their faces, along with confusion and incomprehension. Clementi rushed to Ophelia. She couldn't even blink her eyes, her hands were as cold as water in an autumn river, and her face was pale, like stone. Ophelia, he called softly, come with me. He lifted the girl from behind the table, led her to the garden, and seated her on a bench. Clementi knew she needed to cry. The boy hugged Ophelia tightly, stroked her head, and gently, trying not to breathe, kissed her on the forehead and cheeks. She was crying silently, shuddering, and Clementi felt his heart breaking with pity for Ophelia. They had been embracing for a long time. 
Ophelia's head rested on the boy's shoulder, and he held her tightly, as if with these embraces, he was ready to protect her from the whole world, from any evil and trouble, and from the worst thing that could happen in her life, her father's death. The boy and the girl didn't notice Clementi's mother sitting down next to them. She handed him a glass of water. Let her drink, I added a few drops of sedative there, the woman said softly. Clementi handed the glass to Ophelia, holding it while she was drinking. Everyone is gone, let's go inside. Ophelia shouldn't return home today, we can't leave her alone. Oh, what a tragedy. Clementi's mother stood up and headed towards the house. Ophelia had long been like a daughter to her. Sometimes she even thought that when Clementi returned from the army, he would announce that he wanted to marry her. She and her father would be delighted. Ramiro's daughter was a good girl, and it seemed that Clementi loved her very much. Clementi and Ophelia were sitting on the bench under the blooming lilacs until dawn. The girl, having cried herself to sleep, was resting on his shoulder. Clementi was afraid to move, not wanting to disturb her sleep. How will you manage without me, my love, he thought. A few days later, it was Ophelia's father's funeral. Clementi's mother, Valeriana Iglesias, and her husband took charge of organizing the funeral and memorial service. A table was set in the house. There were workers from the machinery and tractor workshops where Ramiro worked, neighbors, and everyone who respected the deceased man. The chief spoke about Ramiro being an excellent worker and a faithful comrade. With glasses in hand, those present remembered the deceased, had some snacks, and when they left, the women began helping Ophelia clear the table. Ophelia, it will be tough for you alone, Vasco's mother, the one whose house was behind the fence, said to the girl. Here's what I'll tell you, dear. Come live with us. We have a large household. Let's unite. And when you finish school, Vasco will marry you, and you'll live as a strong family. My husband and I will help. You have a house, a large garden, and livestock as well. Delina, aren't you ashamed? Valeriana sharply interrupted her. The girl lost her father. She's left alone in the world, and you're measuring her household. What's there to be ashamed of? Ophelia herself has found a good fortune, retorted Vasco's mother. Your son went to the army. It'll take a lot of time to wait for him. Who will take care of the girl now? Oh, get out of here before I'll call for my husband to tell women everything about you, Valeriana swung a cloth at the woman. It's not the right time, you harlot. We'll see, said Vasco's mother, and she left the house. Valeriana hugged Ophelia by the shoulders. Don't listen to anyone, dear, she said quietly. You'll manage just fine. Your late mother was my good friend. She managed everything herself. She got married very young, too. May she rest in peace. All summer, Ophelia took care of the household and the garden. Valeriana helped her apply for a pension for the loss of the breadwinner, but it was very small. Winter was about to come, and she needed to buy firewood for heating the house. Ophelia took her wallet out of her bag and counted the money. It was all she had left. At least cucumbers and cabbage are growing in the garden, and the hens are laying eggs well, the girl thought as she was heading to the store. On the door of the grocery store, she noticed an ad, Cleaner Wanted. Asked the seller. Hello, Esperanza, she addressed the shopkeeper, I need some black bread and flour. Hello, Ophelia. How are you? Everything is fine. Thank you. The girl packed the bread and flour into a bag and was about to leave, but hesitated. Anything else? The shopkeeper asked. Esperanza, you have an ad on the door. Can I apply for the cleaner position? I'll clean well, trust me. Well, I don't know, dear, the woman said thoughtfully, you'll be going to school soon. How will you manage your studies? I'll manage. Just give me a chance, Ophelia pleaded. Well, okay, come tomorrow morning, I'll show you everything. Thank you very much. I won't let you down. Ophelia hurried home. The next day, even before the store opened, she was at the door. She had to get up earlier than usual to feed the chickens, let the cow out of the gate, and feed the piglets. 
Hi, Ophelia, the shopkeeper Esperanza waved her hand in greeting as she saw Ophelia outside the store. You're already here. Good girl, come in. The shopkeeper gave the girl a bucket, rags, a broom, a mop, and cleaning supplies. While explaining the scope of work, she reminded Ophelia not only to clean the floor, but also to wipe the counters every day. In the fall and spring, you'll have to wash the windows too, but that's if you manage to stay until autumn. I'll manage. Where else can I go? Ophelia assured Esperanza. The pension for my dad is so small, it barely covers food expense. I don't know how I'll buy firewood. Listen, why don't you start selling eggs and milk? That way, you'll have some money, Esperanza suggested. Who in the village needs them? Ophelia laughed. Every household has its own livestock. No, you won't surprise anyone with those goods here. Wait, a family visited me recently. They built a cottage on the outskirts and come here in the summer with their children, Esperanza recounted. So, they were asking where they could buy natural products. They need not only milk and eggs, but also vegetables and greens. And you have a huge garden. What will you do with all that alone? I can talk to them if they come again. Esperanza, that would be so wonderful, Ophelia rejoiced. I really don't have enough money. I just want to finish middle school and move to the city where I can study and find a job. Please talk to them if they come again. Okay, I will, Esperanza promised, but now let's get to work. The sooner you finish, the sooner you can go home and do your own matters. Ophelia grabbed the bucket and went to fetch water. In her heart, hope arose that she wouldn't have to quit school, a thought that had been seriously crossing her mind due to the lack of money, strength, and support. True, Clementi wrote letters almost every week. Ophelia was delighted when she received them. Each line was filled with so much warmth, something close and dear. In the evenings, she wrote him back, but her letters were short, nothing new was happening in the girl's life. Esperanza kept her promise. The urban family, settled in a cottage village beyond the village, started visiting Ophelia every other day. They bought eggs, fresh milk, vegetables, and greens. They paid without asking the price, gave more than Ophelia would dare to ask, and never took change. The girl didn't know how to thank the shopkeeper, Esperanza. Ophelia's customers even told their neighbors in the cottage village about her. Within a couple of weeks, other vacationers from the cottages began to visit her home. Now Ophelia could save money for the future, buy feed for the livestock for the winter, and bring firewood. When bundles of firewood spilled out of the tractor trailer into the yard, the girl looked at this wealth in contemplation. Who is going to split these? She glanced at the axe, took it in her hands, and tried to strike a bundle. The axe blade dug into the wood and refused to detach. Delena, Vasco's mother, was observing all of this from behind the fence. Ophelia, are you planning to chop wood? She shouted. Hello, Galena. How can I chop so much wood? Besides, the axe is so heavy. Women don't do that, the neighbor said, laughing. I'll call for Vasco. He'll quickly deal with your bundles. Ophelia wanted to refuse. She didn't really want to let the nasty Vasco into the yard. However, the woman had already disappeared behind the fence. After a few minutes, Vasco appeared at the gate. Mother said you need to split wood. Thank you, Vasco. Please help. I'll pay you. I can't do it myself. Will you? Okay, Vasco grinned slyly. He took the axe and began chopping wood. Ophelia was watching as the logs piled up into a separate heap. The girl put on her sweater and started putting them in the woodshed, neatly stacking them into piles. Vasco sweated in the heat, took off his shirt, and threw it on the bench. Ophelia, bring some water, it's hot, the guy asked loudly. I'll bring it now, the girl said, heading to the house. She bit over the water barrel when suddenly she felt someone grab her. Ophelia jerked, but Vasco pressed her against the wall. Don't fight back, I won't hurt you. She felt the smell of tobacco in Vasco's mouth. He reached out to kiss her, but Ophelia managed to wriggle free and grab a knife. 
Get lost. I don't vouch for myself. She pointed the blade towards the guy. You're crazy. Vasco spat on the floor and retreated towards the exit. You've gone completely wild here. I was just trying to be nice. Breathing heavily, Ophelia sat on a stool. Tears suddenly streamed from her eyes. Since Clementi's farewell, she hadn't shed a tear, not even at her father's funeral, standing by the grave, unable to let a tear fall. But now, she was crying like a child, as if she were in great pain, as if her entire heart were tearing apart, burning with agonizing pain, and she couldn't bear this pain. A year later, Ophelia graduated from middle school. The end of May was very warm, the scent of lilacs and bird cherry hung in the air. The girl was standing at the bus station, waiting for the bus to go to the village. She was returning home from the city. Ophelia spent the entire day there as she wanted to learn what the admission requirements for the college were, get a list of necessary documents, and undergo a medical examination. There was still half an hour before the bus. She entered the nearest store, bought ice cream and juice, and sat on a bench. May I? Ophelia heard a voice and looked up. A young man was standing in front of the girl with a sports bag hanging over his shoulder. Can I sit here? He asked again. Yes, of course. Ophelia moved slightly, making room. People hurried around with bags and suitcases, leading children by the hand. The vacation season was beginning. Meanwhile, Ophelia's house was full of chores. It was time to plant potatoes and other vegetables in the garden, but she had only managed to dig a few beds. There was neither time nor strength. Ophelia had been thinking of leaving the village and moving to the city. She asked people how to sell the house, but they just shipped their heads. Who needs a little house in the village? Now everyone goes to the south or overseas for vacations. Yet, she couldn't bear to part with the house where her parents had lived and where her childhood had passed. Is something wrong with you? The man suddenly asked. No. Why would you think that? It seemed to me that you looked sad. Just lost in thought. The young man with a pleasant appearance looked attentively at Ophelia. He had a handsome face, his bangs slightly fell on a high forehead, and he kept adjusting them. I understand, my name is Porfirio. And yours? Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to hit on you. I just want to pass the time until the bus arrives. I'm tired of walking around here alone and waiting. I don't think about it. I'm Ophelia, the girl replied. Let me guess. You are a student going home for the holidays. Well, you guessed wrong. I'm still planning to apply. Where are you heading? The man asked again. To the village, that's where I live. What luck. We're on the same route then, Porfirio rejoiced. Are you visiting someone? I've never seen you before. Ophelia scrutinized his face. It was entirely unfamiliar. No. I want to change everything in my life and become a villager. I'm fed up with the city and its noise. I want to start a farm, live on the land, and work. Weird, people nowadays are leaving the village and you're heading there. They announced boarding for the intercity bus. It's time, Ophelia said, getting up from the bench. In the bus, Porfirio took a seat next to the girl. Throughout the journey, he told her things and made her laugh, and after half an hour, it seemed to her like she had known this interesting guy for a long time. Ophelia, do you know where I can rent a house or at least a room in the village? He asked. I don't know, the girl replied. Do you have nowhere to live? It just happened that, leaving everything in the city, I didn't bother in advance about where I'd settle in the new place. Can you suggest someone in the village? I really don't know whom to turn to, but if it's a dire situation, I can let you stay with me for a while. Really? Porfirio was delighted. Don't worry, I won't harm you, and I'll pay well. After all, money is never superfluous. I'm not afraid, Ophelia calmly said with a smile. We're about to get off. Indeed, Ophelia needed money. Plus, she thought that living with Porfirio would be more enjoyable. At least she could talk to someone instead of being alone all day. 
Here, make yourself at home, said Ophelia, letting the guest into the house. She led him to her father's room, which hadn't changed in a year. You'll be comfortable here. I'll bring the kettle and clean sheets. Porfirio looked around. The house was clean and spacious. There were no wealthy items, but it was evident that the girl tried to create comfort. Ophelia arranged cups on the table and laid out cookies and candies on a plate. We'll have coffee now, have a snack, and then I'll prepare dinner, she said to Porfirio. Take a seat. Ophelia, thank you. It's nice here. Porfirio sipped the fragrant coffee and grabbed a cookie. Do you live alone? Yes, my father passed away a year ago, and my mother has been gone for a very long time. I'm sorry. It's okay, I've started to get used to it. At first, it was tough. My father used to manage the farm, and handling everything on my own was a bit challenging. Now, things seem to be fine, but I need to enroll in a college and move to the city. I'll have to sell the cow, and I'm still deciding whether to plant the garden or not. Yes, it's tough on your own, Porfirio nodded. Can you show me around the farm? Of course, I'll show you, the girl laughed. What's there to see? Everything is like everyone else's. But I'm interested. On that same day, Porfirio started digging the garden. Watching him wield the shovel through the window, Ophelia, without realizing it, found herself smiling. Look how a person misses the land. You can immediately see that working brings him joy, she thought. By evening, Ophelia had heated the bathhouse and prepared dinner. She caught herself thinking that she didn't feel any awkwardness or discomfort from having a man in the house, as if he had always lived here and then left and returned. She even thought about selling him the house. However, being entirely without housing was a bit scary, so Ophelia decided she would let him live there and she would come home for vacations. During dinner, she told Porfirio about her idea, and he enthusiastically accepted it, assuring her that both the house, the garden, and the livestock would be in order. Two weeks later, Ophelia submitted her documents to the college, and another two weeks later, she found out that she was not accepted. She returned home very upset. Barely entering her room, she burst into tears from frustration. Why wasn't she lucky at all? Life was already challenging, and now her plans were not meant to come true. Seeing her tears, Porfirio sat down next to her. Why are you so upset? You'll apply again next year, he said, trying to comfort her. Is that the meaning of life? Does everyone have to study at a college and live in the city? And what's the meaning of life for you? Wiping her tears, Ophelia asked. To live comfortably, work, and take pride in my home, farm, and family. I don't have a family, Ophelia said quietly, and there's nothing special to be proud of. Porfirio remained silent for another minute, then said, You know what? Let me help you. Together, we'll manage this farm so well that everyone will envy us. We'll sell meat, milk, eggs, invest the money in the house, or travel. There are so many places in the world I want to see with my own eyes. Ophelia had no other choice, she nodded, not quite understanding how her life would change. Essentially, everything would remain the same, summers with garden chores and long winters with snowy drifts. Ophelia and Porfirio quickly became close friends. Ophelia liked the cheerful, never downcast Porfirio, who turned out to be not only very handy but also enterprising. In just a month, Ophelia's homestead took on a fresher look. There was a new roof on the woodpile, and in the cowshed, Porfirio replaced a door that was almost completely skewed and falling apart. He built new troughs for the livestock. He helped Ophelia in the garden, and everything he did seemed to succeed, as if he had lived in the village all his life. Ophelia has finally found herself a fiancé, the neighbor Galena told the village women. He's a good guy. He looks like he's business-minded, let her be lucky, the men gossiped. And Ophelia just waved off, hearing such conversations. He's not a fiancé to me at all. But she herself increasingly noticed that she liked Porfirio. He knew a lot of interesting things and told Ophelia about different cities where he had been before. Both of them had a difficult childhood, 
Porfirio, like Ophelia, lost his mother. He was just a baby then and didn't even remember her face. My grandmother told me that my mom was beautiful and once some hooligans on the street bothered her. She tried to run away, but they killed her, Porfirio sadly told Ophelia. And she was listening in silence, not noticing a tear rolling down her cheek. She felt pity for the guy who was left without a mother's care due to some scoundrels. It tore her heart. For Ophelia's birthday, Porfirio organized a celebration. In the morning, when she looked out into the yard, she saw numerous balloons hanging on the fence, trees, and bushes. In the middle of the yard, there was a table with a bouquet of flowers on it. The girl came out, and Porfirio, noticing her, looked disappointed. Well, I didn't manage to prepare everything, he said. What's this? Ophelia asked in surprise, braiding her hair. I'm sorry, I saw on the dresser your documents that you collected for college, and there, well, I found out that today is your birthday. So I decided to congratulate you and organize a celebration. Thank you, no one has ever organized such celebrations for me, Ophelia thanked. Do you like it? I also bought a cake. Really? Where did you get it? The girl knew that there were no cakes at the village store. People here preferred pies and baked them at home. I went to the neighboring village yesterday and hid it in the barn, Porfirio replied. Ophelia laughed. She felt so happy and pleased that someone cared for her. Before, her dad used to be the first to wish her a happy birthday, and then Clementi. Well, then, why are we just standing here? I'll go put the kettle on, and you go get your treasure from the barn. We'll have coffee with a cake. Laughing, Ophelia ran into the house. She was in a wonderful, joyful mood. Over coffee, they chatted cheerfully about various things, and then Porfirio suggested. How about grilling meat in the evening? Really? Ophelia was surprised. Yes, let's light a fire and grill some meat. We just need to marinate it first, give it some time, and it'll become juicy. I agree, just do it yourself, I don't know how, the girl supported the idea. While she was weeding the beds, Porfirio built an improvised barbecue in the yard from bricks found around, lit a fire, and nearby, in a pot, there was fragrant meat with various herbs and spices. Ophelia, with a bucket full of cucumbers and tomatoes, was standing in front of Porfirio and couldn't hide her amazement. How could he do everything so quickly? In the evening, they had a real feast. There was a bowl of salad and grilled meat on the table, deliciously smelling of smoke from the bonfire. Porfirio even bought a bottle of wine from the village store. For the birthday girl, right? He said. Ophelia shrugged. She had never tasted wine, her father didn't drink, and there was no alcohol in the house. But Porfirio poured it into two glasses anyway and proposed a toast. To you, Ophelia. Good people are hard to come by, and you. I'm very lucky that I met you at the bus station that day. Happy birthday. He drank from the glass while Ophelia was looking uncertainly at the red liquid. If you don't want to, don't drink, Porfirio smiled, you can just sip symbolically for the holiday. She took a sip of the wine. It was very sweet, delicious, and slightly bitter. I also want to thank you, the girl said. I felt bored alone, and with you, something happens every day. For example, I've never tasted such delicious meat. That's nothing. I'll tell you without false modesty that I have many talents. I have no doubt, Ophelia interrupted him. And I really want to dance. I'll turn on the music now, the birthday girl's wish is law. Porfirio went into the house for an old tape recorder. That evening, they had fun and danced, and Ophelia felt happy, as if she had returned to childhood. She wasn't scared, she wasn't alone in the house. The wine went to her head. Ophelia had been laughing all the time and spinning around the yard. She didn't notice when calm music started playing, and Porfirio, hugging her by the waist, pressed her to him. Shall we dance? He asked, looking into her eyes. Sure. He had very strong arms. Ophelia put her hands on the guy's shoulders, pressed against him, felt Porfirio's heart beating, and he gently kissed her on the cheek. 
Without knowing why, Ophelia felt a surge of warmth in her chest. She enjoyed this touch. That night, Porphyria whispered words to her that the girl had never heard from anyone before. You are the most tender and sensual girl, he said, and she wished these moments, bringing sensations of joy, would never end. Waking up in the morning, she didn't find Porfirio beside her. Ophelia stretched under the blanket and then decisively got up, looked out of the window. In the yard, Porfirio was pouring cold water from a bucket over himself. Porfirio, she waved to him, let's go have breakfast. I'm coming. The girl put the kettle on the stove, took cheese and sausage from the fridge, made sandwiches. Porfirio hugged her, kissed her, and she turned slightly embarrassed. Let's start a new life with this breakfast, he said. I want you to become my wife. Ophelia was stunned by these words. She stayed silent, looking into his eyes. What do you think? Porfirio ran his hand through her hair, and Ophelia felt like a little girl again. I agree. A smile appeared on her face. A month later, Porfirio and Ophelia quietly signed their marriage certificate in the local civil registry. The head of the administration issued them a document stating that they were now husband and wife, and in the fall, Ophelia realized she was pregnant. We'll have a baby, she said over dinner one day. Wonderful news. Her husband seemed happy, but noticing Ophelia's confusion, he understood that she wasn't very thrilled with the news. Wait, don't you want a child? You seem somewhat sad. I don't know. I wanted to try and enter the college again. Porfirio stood up from the table, walked to the window. He was silent, then said, Ophelia, education is not the main goal in life. What will a diploma from the college give you? Golden Mountains, a new spacious beautiful house, a car you can drive to the city whenever you want without worrying about bus schedules? No, it won't give you all that. But how can one live without education, Porfirio? Ophelia asked quietly. Just fine. Normally, he raised his voice, her husband replied. Building a house, raising children, expanding the farm, doing your own thing. Just look, we have everything for it. Land, hands, a head, people around who also want to live well. Ophelia remained silent, lowering her eyes. She was afraid that Porfirio was leading to the point where she should have considered an abortion, have got rid of the baby. She interpreted his words as implying that having children was premature until there was a big beautiful house, a car, and a huge farm. It made her feel sad. We can turn things around the way we want, while all your school friends and girlfriends are studying, he said. They'll come back, and you'll be the owner of a big farm with lots of contracts for the products you produce in your mini factory. What about the child? Ophelia interrupted. What do you mean? Her husband didn't understand. The child will grow up, bring joy to mom and dad, who, in turn, will delight him with new toys, then a computer, trips, whatever their child will want because they love and care for him. Can't you imagine a normal family life? Porfirio, I'm pregnant and we'll have a child, Ophelia said distinctly, emphasizing each word. Not sometime in the future, but in a few months. That's great. It will only motivate us to do everything to be ready for the baby's arrival, he responded. So, you're not against having a child? You're not angry that I'm pregnant? Porfirio threw up his hands, grabbed his head, took a deep breath loudly, then hugged his wife and said, You're such a silly girl. How could I be angry when my little one, my baby, is growing in your belly? A weight seemed to lift off Ophelia's chest. She also hugged Porfirio, pressed against him. The couple began preparing for the birth of their first child. Porfirio decided that over the winter, he must have done repairs in the house, so all the money earned from selling vegetables, meat, and milk was invested in building materials. The house is a bit small for a family, he said, will need to expand in the spring. I'm thinking of extending it and having not only a children's room, but also a bathroom so that everything is well equipped. I'm tired of running to the outhouse. How will you manage all this alone? Ophelia asked. 
I'll hire workers, and in the meantime, we'll save money. Porfirio was determined, and Ophelia was just happy that he was a hard-working man, not a drinker or a party-goer. Winter passed surprisingly quickly. The expectant mother spent evenings knitting and sewing layout items for the baby. The little one was due in May, and Ophelia was eagerly anticipating and, at the same time, somewhat afraid of childbirth. On a warm May day, she stepped out of the gate, led the cow and calf, who were supposed to be accompanied by a village shepherd on their way to the pasture. The sun warmed, and trees were adorned with clean, emerald leaves. Ophelia tilted her face to the sun, closed her eyes. It's so good that the baby will be born in warm weather, we'll be able to take walks with him, she thought. Opening her eyes, she saw a passerby approaching in the distance. He was wearing a military uniform, heading towards her house. The closer he got, the more dizzy Ophelia felt. It was Clementi. The young man looked more mature, more manly, and the military uniform suited him perfectly, as if tailored meticulously. Clementi stopped a couple of meters away from Ophelia. He was gazing at her, unable to utter a word. His eyes expressed surprise, incomprehension, bitterness. Clementi couldn't take his eyes off Ophelia's protruding belly. He had dreamt of meeting her for these two years. And here she was, pregnant, looking good and desirable. Hello, Clementi, Ophelia said and took a few steps toward her childhood friend. You're back? For good? Yes, I'm back. Two years flew by. And you, it seems like you weren't eagerly waiting for me. How could you say that? I wrote you letters. Well, lately there haven't been many. I understand now, you were too busy to drop me a line, more important things came up. What are you talking about? Ophelia lowered her eyes. I got married, and soon I'll become a mother. Congratulations. There was so much pain, disappointment, and hurt in his eyes that it made Ophelia uncomfortable. During his two years in the army, Clementi thought about how he would return to the village and propose to Ophelia. He loved her more than life itself, and the distance only made him realize it even more. Night after night, tossing in his military bed, he saw her image, mentally held her close, caressed her dark, flowing hair, gazed into her eyes. Thoughts of Ophelia sustained him through the toughest moments. Clementi's biggest dream was to return home as soon as possible. How heartbreaking it must have been for him now to see his beloved pregnant with another man's child. Clementi, my boy, Valeriana's voice rang out. His mother came out of the fence and saw her son. You're back, my dear. The woman rushed to Clementi and Ophelia, embraced her son, pulled him close, kissed his cheeks, barely reaching his face. Let's go home. What joy we have. Neighbors were already peeking out of the windows of nearby houses, and Clementi and Ophelia couldn't stop looking at each other. His mother was dragging him towards the gate, but he seemed frozen. Come on, Clementi, she urged him. Go on, mother, I'll come soon. Clementi pushed Valeriana away from him. In a minute. The woman stepped aside but didn't hurry home. She had been waiting for this moment and, at the same time, was afraid of it. Valeriana hadn't written to Clementi about Ophelia's marriage and pregnancy. She knew this news would break his heart, so she decided to let him serve in peace, come what might. I need to go, Clementi said to Ophelia. I'm glad everything's fine with you. He quickly caught up with his mother, hugged her, and together they disappeared behind the fence of their home. Ophelia slowly walked into the yard, not knowing why she felt so agitated that she couldn't calm down. Her temples were throbbing, and her lower back suddenly ached, as if she had been working in the garden all day. Suddenly, she felt a strong pain in her abdomen. She stopped, clutching the trunk of a cherry tree, bent over, and whispered quietly, Porfirio. Ophelia's husband peered out of the barn, where he was planing boards. Seeing his wife writhing in pain, he rushed to her. What? What happened? Porfirio asked anxiously. It seems to start. Oh, it hurts so much. Ophelia felt something warm running down her legs. Her water broke. Quiet, 
Sit down, breathe deeper, the man said, seating her on the bench. How is that possible? There are still two weeks. Oh, Porfirio, it hurts so much, Ophelia whispered. All right, just sit for a moment, I'll be right back, Porfirio said and ran to the neighbors. Bursting into the neighboring yard, he shouted, Valeriana, quickly. Where is your husband? He's in the field. It's planting season soon, the woman said. What happened? Why do you need him? Ophelia is in labor, and we need to take her to the hospital. Damn it, all the men are probably in the fields, and the ambulance won't arrive in time. What should we do? Go to her. I'll be there shortly. Only now did the agitated Porfirio notice a tall guy in military uniform next to the neighbor. Where are the car keys, mother? The woman ran into the house, brought the keys to the old car, and Clementi got behind the wheel, shouting. Open the gate. Approaching Ophelia's gate, he opened the rear door, helping Porfirio seat his wife. Let's go faster, Porfirio requested anxiously. As fast as I can. Don't worry. I hope she won't feel worse on such a road. With a screech of tires, the car raced at breakneck speed toward the village exit. At the hospital, Ophelia was quickly placed on a gurney and taken down the corridor. Porfirio and Clementi were left alone in the reception area. A bit calmer now, Ophelia's husband reached out to the unfamiliar guy. Thank you. I'm Porfirio, so it turns out I'm your neighbor now, he said. Clementi looked at the outstretched hand and then at Porfirio. No problem, he said, not shaking hands, and took a seat. What's your name? Porfirio lowered his hand. Clementi. Thanks, Clementi. You came back just in time. Where would I find a car in the village now? A nurse appeared at the door, the first one to run out when Ophelia was brought to the hospital. Oh, you guys are really reckless, she said, shaking her head. You barely made it. A little longer, and she would have started giving birth in your car. How is she? Is everything okay? Porfirio rushed up to her. Well, who knows? They took her straight to the delivery room. The girl is holding on. She doesn't even scream. Sometimes you hear such screams here from labor pains, the nurse smirked. You'd hear how your wives curse you for the pain and suffering of childbirth. They threaten to kick you out and even kill you, but once the baby is born, there's no limit to happiness. That's who women are. Three hours passed. During this time, Porfirio and Clementi sat in silence. Each was lost in their own thoughts. Finally, the door creaked open and the same nurse appeared in the doorway. Your wife has given birth, she said. Congratulations, Daddy. You have a healthy boy, 3,600 grams. A son, Porfirio sighed with relief. His face lit up with a benevolent smile. Clementi, my friend, did you hear? I have a son, he exclaimed. Porfirio wanted to hug Clementi as his emotions overwhelmed him. However, Clementi backed away and only said, Congratulations. You guys, go home, the nurse said. There's nothing to do here now. Bring your wife's things tomorrow. It looks like you didn't pack anything in a hurry. Go on. Clementi walked toward the car, and Porfirio followed him. On the way, the young man was incessantly chatting, apparently affected by the stress he had experienced. I had been waiting for him, worrying about the firstborn being a son and not a girl. A man needs a son, a helper, and what's the use of girls always clinging to their mother's skirt? Am I right, Clementi? Clementi shrugged uncertainly, but Porfirio didn't even notice. I really need sons. I'm planning to build my own business, and I can't do it without help. And with Ophelia, we'll have five more kids. She's young, I'm strong, and things in bed are going well for us. Clementi abruptly hit the brakes, and his passenger almost hit his head on the windshield. Are you out of your mind? Exclaimed Porfirio. You need to be careful, you could have crashed. Sorry, Clementi muttered quietly through his teeth. 
I was lost in thought. Returning to the village, Clementi stopped at his house. His mother was already waiting for him at the gate. She was worried and rushed to meet him. How is Ophelia? Did you get her there in time? Son. I have a son, Valeriana. Porfirio shared his joy. Thanks to Clementi, he drove us. The doctor said she was about to give birth on the road. Well, thank God. Let's go home, Clementi. You just got off the road, hungry and tired. No, no, Valeriana, Porfirio interrupted her. We must celebrate this event a little. After all, it's my firstborn. What do you think, Clementi? Let's have a little drink for the newborn, so to speak. Let's celebrate it. Clementi wanted to refuse, but Valeriana didn't let him get a word in. I won't let you drink on an empty stomach. Come into the yard. I'll set the table. We'll wash the baby's feet there. After all, a new person has been born. Come on. Under the canopy in the yard, the guy sat at the table, and Valeriana served boiled potatoes, fat, greens, and boiled meat. Enjoy your meal, otherwise you'll get too drunk, she said. The woman sat down next to them, unable to take her eyes off her son. In two years, he had grown up, but it wasn't the physical changes that Valeriana noted, watching how Clementi took a shot. There was something in his gaze that wouldn't let her rest. It was either longing, disappointment, or pain. Porfirio poured another round. Come on, Clementi, let's drink for my son's health, he said. And you know, I couldn't come up with a name for him, but now I know for sure, I'll name him Clementi after you. How about that idea? Clementi Torres. Sounds good. Clementi almost choked upon hearing his neighbor's decision, but Porfirio didn't even notice his reaction. He just kept pouring into the glasses. He went home quite drunk, swaying on the way. Upon returning from the hospital, Ophelia immersed herself in motherhood. She really loved taking care of her son, feeling like the happiest mother on earth. Porfirio, on the other hand, was busy expanding their living space. He had already laid the foundation for an extension, which was planned to be larger than the old house. In this new section, he planned to have a living room, a nursery for his son Clementi, and a bathroom with a toilet. A well was already built on the plot, from which water would flow into the house. There would be no need to haul it in buckets from the well. He tirelessly traveled to the district center, buying materials, and one day he came up with a new idea. Ophelia, we need to expand our business, he said to his wife during dinner. Why? Is there something we lack? For now, we're managing, but we're not saving anything, and we need to do it. Without savings, we won't get anywhere. Tell me, do you want to take our son to the sea? Do you want to show him the world? Do we need our own car to go to the city? And there will come a time when we need to provide our son with an education. That makes sense. But how do you plan to expand? Asked Ophelia, pouring coffee for her husband. Tomorrow I'll go to the village administration and talk about leasing land. I'm thinking of building a farm. It's not an easy task, sighed Ophelia. Money doesn't come easily, replied Porfirio, raising his index finger, remember that. But I'll make it work. Just make sure to give me more children. Well, not in the near future, for sure, Ophelia shook her head. I will remember all these hardships for a long time. And Clementi needs attention, so wait a bit with the heirs. She got up from the table and started clearing the dishes. They lived peacefully and harmoniously. Porfirio put all his inexhaustible energy into his work. Ophelia was only bothered by his disregard for neighbors. This spring... Porfirio bought a motor block to avoid digging the garden with a shovel. And when neighbors asked to borrow it, he said, Save money, and then you can buy such a machine for yourselves, refusing to help. And once, Ophelia asked him to buy a potted flower. She had seen it in the store in the district center and really liked the plant. But Porfirio refused, saying that if they spent money on such nonsense, there would be nothing left for necessary things. An unpleasant situation also arose with two hired workers who helped her husband build the frame for the extension. 
Porfirio promised to pay them, and when the work was done, he brought a calculator to the porch, subtracted the money they spent on food and cigarettes, deducted it from the agreed payment, and paid them less than half. The rumor about Porfirio's greed spread throughout the village. She often overheard people whispering behind her back, but she tried not to pay attention. It was none of her business. She was happy to be a mother, constantly fussing over the baby, and her eyes only saddened when she saw Clementi. He didn't greet her at all. When he saw her at the end of the street, he turned around and went in the other direction. Clementi avoided any interaction with Ophelia. But one day, they unexpectedly bumped into each other at the store. Do you love him? Clementi asked. Of course, smiled Ophelia, adjusting the little hat on her son's head. How can one not love such a miracle? I'm not talking about the son, the guy dryly said. Do you love your husband? Ophelia hesitated. The question from her childhood friend caught her off guard. She had never thought about it. She was content and peaceful with Porfirio, a non-drinking, hard-working man who did everything for the house and family. We are a family, Clementi. I see that you don't love him. Clementi suddenly took her hand, and he doesn't love you. He doesn't love anyone. He only thinks about money. Stop it, Clementi. The woman tried to interrupt him. Leave him, Ophelia, Clementi pleaded. I can't live without you. I'll love your son as my own, and I'll never do anything bad for him. Stop it, Ophelia pulled her hand away. Her cheeks were burning like fire. I have to go. She walked quickly down the street, pushing the stroller ahead of her, while Clementi was sadly watching her go. When she got home, he took out a sports bag from the closet and threw some things into it. Mom, where's my passport? He shouted. In the drawer, Valeriana replied, entering her son's room. Where are you going? I'm going to the district center. I have a friend there. He serves in the police. He called me and said they need me there. And there's nothing left for me to do here. Ten years passed. Porfirio was confidently moving towards his dream. He managed to lease a large plot of land outside the village where he began building a farm. To the surprise of the villagers, everything worked out for him. When necessary, he could negotiate and purchase materials at a favorable price. He bribed those who needed to be bribed so they wouldn't bother him too much and got the necessary permits easily. Porfirio passed various inspections by sanitary services with ease, arranging real feasts for the inspectors. Satisfied with such treatment, the inspectors signed all the documents without looking. Five years after the start of construction, the farm was already generating a good income, and Porfirio began building a small workshop for meat and milk processing. There was no shortage of workers. People from the entire village came to work for him. Porfirio paid them a little, but the labor market in rural areas was not known for its diversity and high salaries. So when the workers asked for a raise or overtime pay, he sent them away without thinking. If you don't like it, you can leave, Porfirio would say. There are plenty of people willing to work here. Clementi went to school. Like his mother once did, he traveled to a neighboring village with other kids. Despite Porfirio having his car, he didn't want to take the boy, even though Ophelia asked him to. No way, Porfirio replied to his wife's requests to take their son to school. Let him take the bus like everyone else. And if it's raining... Well, he'll get the bus. Ophelia spent her entire day taking care of the house. She often went to the farm to personally supervise the work of the milkmaids and carry out her husband's assignments. Women often complained to her about poor working conditions, the absence of a canteen, and places to rest, but Ophelia just spread her hands and sighed. All her conversations with her husband were in vain. What kind of place to rest do they need? Porfirio would protest. They come here to work, not to rest. Rain doesn't wet them, and wind doesn't blow. They should be grateful for that. But sometimes, Porfirio still made grand gestures. For the celebration of the arrival of summer, he organized festivities on the square, brought local amateur artists from a neighboring village, set up tables with treats, and on that day, children were given candies and gingerbreads for free. 
Enjoy the celebration, all of you, Porfirio concluded his solemn festive speech. The people applauded approvingly and reached for the tables. The celebration lasted until late in the evening, with music playing and people dancing. For New Year's, the successful farmer brought a tall artificial Christmas tree adorned with LED lights to the village and set up a slide for the children next to it. After such events, the villagers praised Porfirio and said thank you, but anything related to work on the farm again and again provoked dissatisfied grumbling. Eventually, Ophelia decided to be persistent. Porfirio, for the last time, allocate a space for a recreation room and a dining area. They are people, not animals. They shouldn't eat the food they brought in cans, sitting in the cowsheed. Fine, promised her husband. Once the snow melts, we'll build a log cabin, and you can set up your dining area there. In late May, a large house appeared near the farm. Ophelia personally took care of the interior and decor. She practically begged her husband for money for furniture and dishes. When she mentioned hiring a cook, Porfirio lost his temper. How much longer can this go on? You'll bleed me dry. We have a farm, not a resort, to be arranging sofas and feeding them with dishes. Porfirio, don't forget where you started, Ophelia reminded him. She was determined to create normal working conditions for the employees. You came to my house, found a roof over your head here, and I haven't denied you anything. Remembered, did you? Her husband looked at her reproachfully. What are you unhappy with? You dress up perfectly. I take you to the city hairdressers so the village women will envy you. Or do you want to count every penny again? Porfirio. Ophelia sternly looked at her husband. I'm telling you, we need a cook, and that's it. Next week, I'll go to the city and need to buy something, get the money ready, including for the cook. And if you don't agree, I'll stand at the stove myself and feed the workers. Damn it, Porfirio muttered when his wife left. Clementi, put on the kettle. I haven't eaten anything since morning, Marcello asked. The boss is raging, demanding progress on all matters related to the department store raid. Clementi took the kettle. It was empty. I'll fetch some water, he said, leaving the office. For ten years, Clementi had served in the district police department, investigating. He regretted nothing. His career was developing well, and he enjoyed solving crimes. Initially, of course, he had to delve into many things, but under the leadership of Marcello, who had been working for many years, Clementi quickly became accustomed to the job. He left the village immediately after returning from the army. His beloved girl became someone else's wife, and she even gave birth to a son while he served for two years, dreaming every day of marrying Ophelia and starting a strong family. Unable to live next to his beloved and her husband, Clementi decided to leave. Luckily, his army buddy served in the police and promised to help him get a job. For the first few months, the guy lived with his friend, and then, after several months, he got official housing, a room in a dormitory. Not a separate apartment, of course, but he didn't need more for himself. Despite his mother's calls to visit, Clementi never went back to the village. His parents sometimes came to see him, bringing meat, jam made from berries gathered in the forest, and various gifts. His father even tried to give money to his son, saying that life in the city had completely different expenses and they didn't know what to do with the money. But Clementi didn't take it. His salary was enough for him. Here you go, Marcello. Clementi placed a mug of coffee in front of his colleague. Maybe I should go to the cafeteria. You must be hungry. No need, Clementi, Marcello replied without looking up from his papers. Thanks for the coffee. The major sorted through documents, arranging photographs into different piles. Clementi lingered, curiously studying one of them. The face seemed familiar to him. Who's this? He asked, pointing at the black and white photograph. Oh, that's some slick guy we never found, the major waved his hand. I don't understand why this photo is in the folder. The case is long closed. Do me a favor and toss it in the trash. It's no longer needed. What did he do? Clementi took the photograph and headed towards the trash bin. Fraud, theft. And they never caught him? 
He was clever and covered his tracks so well that not a single detective could catch him. Marcelo glanced away from his papers, recalling the old case. He rented apartments with expensive furnishings, then took out all the equipment and disappeared. What was the point? Clementi asked. Renting an apartment requires money. That's the point. He paid for a month, then took out equipment equivalent to several years' worth of rent. Oh, you have an impressive memory, Marcelo, Clementi exclaimed in admiration. It's an old case, and still you remember. It stuck with me for a reason, Clementi, the major took a sip from his mug and lit a cigarette. When we started rebuilding connections, trying to find those who knew him, it turned out he forced his mother to sign a sale agreement for the apartment against her will. Then he placed the woman in a homeless shelter. How's that? Just like that. He drugged her with some pills, brought her to the shelter, and claimed he found her on the road. He dressed his mother in rags and handed her over to the government to take care of her. That's the kind of son he was. Why didn't she file a complaint against him? Clementi asked. She was a strange one. She was very quiet and hardly said a word. She told the shelter workers what happened to her when she came to her senses, but the investigator couldn't get any information from her directly, only from the nurses. He questioned her over and over, then just waved it off. Why? Because, Clementi, this guy was a real sly one, and the investigator had no use for him. Well, may no one ever have such a son. Clementi looked at the photograph once again and was about to toss it into the trash when he changed his mind. He sat down at the table and started scrutinizing the face captured in the photo. It seemed very familiar to him, as if he had seen this person somewhere before. Suddenly, Clementi remembered it was Porfirio, Ophelia's husband. He felt a cold chill. How could Ophelia marry a criminal? Marcelo, Clementi called the major. What? His colleague remained absorbed in studying the documents, not bothering to lift his head. What if I knew where this person was? I can show you. Forget it, Clementi. Who needs that? The case is closed, and nobody will reopen it today. You won't find anyone who suffered from those apartments. Let him think he got lucky. Where can I see this case? In the archives? Clementi persisted. Probably. Marcelo glanced at Clementi and immersed himself back in his work. Locating the forgotten case within the depths of the archives was not a difficult task for Clementi. After spending about half an hour in the office, he thoroughly examined the old story and noted the address of the shelter where Porfirio's mother could still be living. And even if she wasn't there, maybe one of the workers remembered something. Clementi decided that he would definitely visit the shelter and find out who Porfirio really was. Porfirio inspected the dining room. Ophelia had certainly done her best. A long wooden table was covered with a beautiful checkered tablecloth, soft cushions lay on the benches, and flower pots adorned the walls. A young girl, barely a high school student, was arranging plates on the table, setting out spoons and forks. Well, how do you like it? What do you say, Porfirio? Ophelia asked her husband, expecting approval. She enjoyed the cozy atmosphere she had created with her own hands. Don't you think you've gone a bit too far? What do you mean? Ophelia was as calm as a cucumber, watching as her husband started to get angry. Why spend money on a tablecloth? Do they think they won't be able to eat a piece of bread without one? And where did you get the flowers? Did you buy them in the city? Why splurge on forks? Everyone can eat with spoons. It's not a restaurant. Porfirio, I didn't buy just one tablecloth. I bought three to change them from time to time. Flowers create a cozy atmosphere, help people relax and unwind, and normal people use forks. You can't eat a patty with a spoon. Why bother frying patties? A plate of soup is enough. And why should they relax here? They come to the farm and the workshop to work, not to relax. Stop it. You're working with people, not slaves. It's not the Middle Ages anymore. It's the age of new technologies. 
People want to live and work in humane conditions, not in a barn, Ophelia presented argument after argument to her husband, resolute and unexpectedly assertive. I want you to organize transportation for the workers for both shifts. Women from far away have to walk at 4 o'clock in the morning, and after the night shift, workers return in the dark when it's cold or it's raining. It's not normal, Porfirio. Anything else? Maybe I should provide each of them with a car and a personal driver? Did you hear me? That's all for now. Ophelia took the papers set aside and walked towards the exit. Oh yes, don't make me divide the business. I can legally take over the farm. And you'll be left with your workshop. I don't want to pour money into something that doesn't generate income. I have other plans, Porfirio yelled after her. Ophelia just waved her hand, not even turning around. Yesterday, the women at the store were discussing their husband's relationship with the secretary. The girl lived in a neighboring village and got a job in Porfirio's workshop. At work, she noted the lateness of the workers, answered phone calls, and spent most of her working hours putting on lipstick and admiring herself in the mirror. They say Porfirio sleeps with her, one of the women said. No way. He has such a beautiful and smart wife, another exclaimed. The women fell silent when they saw Ophelia approaching, but she had already caught the essence of the conversation. She long suspected that Porfirio was cheating on her. He could even spend the night away, citing a lot of work in the city. Ophelia learned to live with it, but increasingly realized that she needed a backup plan. That's why she opened a bank account for her son. Greeting the villagers, Ophelia bought bread and headed home. She was already tired, and she still had to prepare dinner. Porfirio returned late. Will you have dinner? Ophelia asked. She had already cleared the table, checked her son's homework, and started washing the dishes. Starving like a beast, said Porfirio, seating himself at the table. Ophelia placed a plate of pasta in front of him, added a breaded patty, and moved a bowl of cucumber and tomato salad closer. Clementi and a few other students from school are being sent to a seaside camp, she said, joining him at the table. Ophelia poured coffee for her husband. What's that all about? Porfirio asked. He performed well in all the school contests this year, so they rewarded him with a trip, she explained. Well done. But parents have to cover half the cost of the trip. I need to transfer $25,000 by the end of the week. Porfirio put his fork down on the table and sighed. On New Year's, Ophelia made him buy an expensive computer for their son. He allocated the money, acknowledging the need for technology in education, but a trip to the sea seemed unnecessary. Let him stay at home, he said to his wife. It's an unsettled time. There's no reason to let him go anywhere with just anyone. You're being stingy again? Ophelia protested. Fine, if you're frugal with other people, but this is your son, your own son, in case you forgot. I already provide for you, he retorted. But seeing his wife's stern look, he thought it better not to push further. I've said it all, Ophelia. He'll grow up, earn money, and go wherever he wants, whether to the sea or an international resort. Let's close this topic. I'm going to bed, said Ophelia, getting up from the table. She understood that talking to her husband was pointless. The better things went on the farm and at the workshop, the higher his level of greed. Lately, it has been off the charts. And unlike when Porfirio first entered her life, she didn't notice back then that he would pinch every penny. Combing her hair in front of the mirror in the bedroom, Ophelia thought about what tied her to her husband. They hadn't lived as husband and wife for a long time. They didn't go anywhere together and didn't celebrate family holidays. When she was a young girl, Porfirio seemed wise, strong, and caring, and their shared loss of mothers united them. Porfirio also grew up without a mother. Maybe that's why he turned out so rough. Maybe he just never knew what maternal love and care were, the desire of a mother to give her child the very best. Clemente shook for hours on a bumpy road in the bus, hoping it would be worth it. He was heading to the shelter where Porfirio had brought his mother long ago, leaving her there under the guise of an unknown woman. Why he did it, Clemente didn't know, but he really wanted to see the woman. 
If he was lucky, she could tell him a lot about her son. The shelter director was surprised when she learned the purpose of Clementi's visit. The case seems to be closed. We haven't heard from the police for a long time, the woman said. I'm here unofficially, Clementi assured. I just wanted to see this woman and try to talk to her. That's not prohibited. I can't stop you. Just remember, lonely people are very vulnerable, so be delicate, the woman cautioned. Of course, promised Clementi. Then go to the courtyard. The woman stood up and approached the window. There she is, in the blue sweater. Hello. Are you Olivia Gonzalez? Clementi asked the woman who was weeding the flower bed. My name is Clementi. I'd like to talk to you. Yes, I'm Olivia. The woman carefully examined the young man. What do you want? She asked. Clementi looked around and noticed a bench. Let's sit down, he suggested. They walked to the bench. I'm interested in knowing more about your son, Porfirio, Clementi began. He noticed that the woman's expression changed. She stared into the distance, seemingly detached from everything around her. Clementi could barely hear the name of Ophelia's husband. Don't worry, everything's fine with him. He's just the husband of my neighbor. Is he healthy? The woman suddenly asked, looking into Clementi's eyes. He is. Tell me, how did you end up here? Did he bring you here? Why did he abandon you in this shelter? Clementi, do you want to harm him? Porfirio's mother tried to understand the stranger's intentions. No, I want to open his wife's eyes because she's my beloved woman, Clementi replied, deciding to be honest to the end. Yes, he brought me here, but I remember little. At first, I signed documents for the sale of the apartment, and then I found myself here. When I realized what happened, the apartment already had a new owner, and my son was missing. The police looked for him after that. You said he's married. Yes, his wife, Ophelia, is the best in the world. She is very kind and good. And you also have a grandson. At this news, Olivia's eyes sparkled, and she smiled. A grandson, you say, she whispered. What's he like? You will be able to see him very soon and meet him yourself. Clementi has no grandparents. Your son said that you passed away, and Ophelia is an orphan. I think Clementi will be very happy that he now has a grandmother. What kind of grandmother am I? I don't even have money to buy gifts for my grandson. That doesn't matter. Clementi continued to talk to Porfirio's mother for some time and said goodbye, promising to return very soon. He decided that over the weekend he would go to the village and tell Ophelia everything. Porfirio's 35th birthday was approaching. Ophelia wondered whether her husband would celebrate his birthday or, as usual, choose to forget about it. To her surprise, he himself suggested organizing a family celebration. You know, I have a better idea, said Ophelia. Let's have a real celebration with guests and gifts. Let's invite people from the district administration. What's wrong with that? You're one of the most successful farmers. They will gladly come to congratulate you. We'll set up tents in the field near the workshop, cover large tables, and invite musicians. Let everyone see that you can not only work but also celebrate holidays. Ophelia knew that Porfirio's pride would not resist such flattery, and he agreed. And so it happened. She took care of all the organization of the holiday. On the appointed day, from early in the morning, people were bustling on the picturesque meadow. About a hundred guests were invited. Ophelia was watching as the tables were set. Don't forget to place name tags so that guests know where to sit, she advised the assistants. Porfirio appeared in a beautiful new suit with a tie. He looked dignified. After inspecting the set tables, he said to his wife, Ophelia, why put expensive wine and snacks on the far table? Workers will sit there, and Moonshine will suit milkmaids and stackers. Don't be petty, Porfirio. Let people see that you spare nothing for them, otherwise there will be all sorts of nasty things said about you later. The man frowned but agreed. Gradually, distinguished guests arrived. 
Among them were partners to whom Porfirio supplied cheese, milk, curd, cream, and meat. Everyone took their seats, placing large gift boxes nearby. One by one, the guests stood up and made congratulatory speeches. Porfirio proudly smiled. Guests praised him for turning from a simple guy who grew up without a mother into a self-made man with tremendous success, his own business, and a strong family. Music was playing, interrupted by applause. Toasts and merriment were in full swing when Ophelia took the floor. Dear friends, we are very grateful to all of you for your support and for your invaluable work. Porfirio, of course, is commendable, but without your contribution to the farm and production, he could not have achieved success. Isn't that right, dear? She looked at her husband, who tensed up and nodded. Therefore, Porfirio wants to thank all of you for your efforts and loyalty. All farm and workshop workers will receive a bonus equal to one month's salary starting next Monday. Congratulations, friends. Ophelia raised a glass of wine, solemnly scanning the faces of those present. The guests applauded joyfully. They liked this news. Only Porfirio did not rejoice or smile. Rising from the table, his face crimsoning with anger, he said, Calm down, Ophelia is just joking. Her jokes are so cheerful. Everything stays the same, and we still have to work for many years before we see any bonus. The unsuspecting guests looked at each other in surprise, while Porfirio, turning to his wife, said, You're taking a bit too much on yourself, Ophelia, he said angrily, not caring that the people present could hear him. Who do you think you are? You're a woman, and your business is scrubbing floors. Or have you forgotten where the mop is? All you do is spend money. Do you even know how I got the money to start this business? Porfirio was beside himself with rage. And Ophelia was standing there, looking at him with a calm gaze. I know, my dear, she replied. I know how you got the money to start your business, and unfortunately for you, I'm not the only one. Clementi. Clementi stepped out of the nearby car. He opened the rear door and extended his hand to the elderly woman. Let's go, Olivia. Don't be afraid. Let me introduce, dear guests, Ophelia said loudly, this is Olivia. She is the mother of our successful entrepreneur and farmer, Porfirio. Many years ago, he deceitfully sold her apartment and dumped his mom in a shelter for the homeless, taking her documents. Then he committed several crimes, robbing ordinary people who had worked for years to earn what this person stole from their homes. Porfirio was wanted by the police, but he managed to escape, largely thanks to me. It was me who led him into my home back then and later married him. But I didn't know about her husband's past. According to him, Olivia died at the hands of some thugs on the street when she was returning home alone. Poor Porfirio was left all alone as a little boy. He hardly remembered his mother. Or maybe he didn't want to remember. Am I telling the truth, dear? That's how you started your business. Now everyone knows about it, and the bonus for good work will come, believe me. I'm telling you this as the new farm manager. Porfirio was shaking with anger. He was ready to rush at his wife with his fists to make her shut up forever. And he would have done it if the police officers, who had unexpectedly appeared, hadn't apprehended Porfirio. Clementi had put in a lot of effort to find the victims of a long-forgotten case, and they filed a request to reopen the investigation. Justice prevailed. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.